Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Welcome to the launch event for National Science Week here in Victoria. Perhaps, actually, no, I take that back. Not perhaps, definitely the best week of the year. A very warm welcome to the Melbourne Museum. Uh, we've got a wonderful evening for you talking about science at the extreme. Um, my name's Nate Byrne. Uh, you m may know me, you may not. Uh, it's quite all right if you don't. I get up very early every morning for ABC News Breakfast. I'm the weather presenter. I'm a meteorologist, formerly a naval officer, and uh, just kind of learning how to do all of the fun science stuff in fun science ways. And I got up this morning very early because we had some extreme weather today in the southeast of the country, which I thought was just perfect for what was going to happen tonight, talking about extreme environments all around the world. And we've got people who have done everything from going to the harshest deserts to the coldest ice fields, to the deepest parts of the ocean for you tonight. Before we uh, move on at all, I really think we need to take a moment to uh, welcome Uncle Bill Nicholson to the stage, who's going to welcome us to his country. So uh, thank you, Nate, and um, thank you to um, the the, uh, the people behind tonight's event in actually incorporating a welcome to country at your gathering. For thousands and thousands of years of the Wurundjeri people's connection to this sacred land, when people have come onto our country, there has been a formal ceremony to actually introduce you to country, give you permission to uh, to use the resources of land and to create strong relationships. And I'll explain that shortly. But first of all, I'd just like to start off uh, welcoming you to the land in the language of the land. The Wurundjeri language is Woi Warang, something that was taken from us over 150 years ago, but something that is, we're trying to revitalise as part of our healing and our connection back to our culture. So I'd like to say to you all tonight, Wiminjika, Gabamala Mangil, Balambun Yalanbu, Walanjeri Balak, Mirina Marenbik, Bill Nicholson. Welcome and greetings, a good day from the Wurundjeri people. My name is Uncle Bill Nicholson. Now, I'm um, standing here representing my people as an elder. I stand very proud, but also very responsible. I'd like to acknowledge my elders past for a couple of very special reasons. First of all, I have an identity, I have a culture. I'm actually here today representing my people. So I acknowledge my elders past for culture, identity and my survival. A couple by name to make them real. Simon Wonga, uh, anyone knows the eastern suburbs at all, Wonga Park, uh, named after Simon. He's our first land rights advocate. He was actually there at the meeting with John Batman. Uh, William Barrack, his predecessor, he's got a face on, the, uh, on a building at the end of Swanson Street here. Um, he's our first land rights, uh, sorry, our first human rights advocate. And uh, I actually encourage people to, uh, to connect to their stories. They're very inspirational stories um, from Simon and from William Barrack. And I've got to acknowledge Nan, because in 1863, there was only 18 of us left. Nan was born in 1914, met an Irishman named Paddy, and had 16 kids. So uh, she helped revitalise the population. <laughs> but also it was my personal connection to my identity. I've also, I'd like to extend that acknowledgement to Dad. Um, it's a little bit sad to stand here and, 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 and explain that he just joined the ancestors. But Dad was the one that opened the door for my family to connect to our, our identity and culture. And like he used to say to us a lot, get out there and tell this city the story that it needs to hear from the Wurundjeri perspective. So Wurundjeri, or Wurundjeri, we are the sole surviving sovereign clan of the Bidadung. You would probably know that as the Yarra River. Birarangma, the banks of the Misty River. It is our symbol of our physical and spiritual connection to this sacred land. We are part of a, a, diver, a more diverse nation called the Kulin Nation, which takes up part of a lot of southern and central Victoria. And if you extend that to the whole continent, over 250 different languages, 700 dialects, and over 3,000 different fam, uh, clan groups. Our culture, I'll give you a bit of a snapshot. Yes, we were uh, the first scientists here on country. And uh, one thing that I, 
that I believe would have really benefited this country is if my elders were respected in such a way where their knowledges were actually put down as part of the science, the knowledge, the history of this country. Because a lot of science, uh, science endeavours today are actually finding information that my ancestors would have known for many, many generations. So a very sustainable culture, up to 40, 50, 60,000 years. I don't even put a number to it. Uh, our story says since the beginning of human consciousness. So either way, it's a long time. A very uh, structured society under law, a very fit and healthy society, a very responsible society. And that responsibility actually um, relates to caring or understanding country and caring for country and looking after one another. That's something I'd like to encourage everyone here tonight to take that personal responsibility on. Because if you live on this land, you work on this land, you even visit this land, personal responsibility of at least understanding its wants and needs because the health of country very much relates to the health of people um, residing on country. And I'd like to encourage everyone to take that responsibility on. Now, the colonial times, yes, were very difficult for our people. Um, that statistic I gave you earlier, um, I suppose, is a, is a way to understand that. But some of the frustrations from the past still very much resonate within our community. So here's a message from the past. Let's learn from past mistakes. Let's never let them occur again. And uh, respect one another in, the, uh, in, in a word I'd like to share with you tonight, Jindy Warabak. Come together, join and unite. You know, we have weeks uh, here in Australia relating to reconciliation. Now, I really believe true reconciliation can be created in this country if we can create a pride within the non-Indigenous communities with, it, uh, with the same pride we have for our culture. And it's something um, that is very, needs very much work, but I really believe uh, the education from the, the Aboriginal perspectives is a real key to bridging gaps. Because if you went to school here in Melbourne, there's a very good chance you've probably never even heard of Wurundjeri or heard of any Aboriginal culture. So we're trying to encourage to bring that into the different schooling systems and different levels to try and bridge those gaps and create a pride of our culture as we have that pride for culture. So I'll just finish off and uh, explain what a welcome to country actually is. So Australian law today says if you want to access another country or you want to get into this country, you need a passport. Where Andre says you need a ceremony. The ceremony is called Tendaram Naji. And very simplistically, when you were brought onto this sacred land or when you came and visited us, we would offer you vegetation to symbolise your resource access. I call them sacred. Our plant, our animal, our water resources. Then we would snap the reed spear, a passive symbol in our culture, to symbolise that you were safe here on country and no one would harm you. A real key ingredient to feeling welcomed. We would sip water and offer it to you to symbolise trust and respect. And then we would get you to walk through the smoke of burning leaves. Now when the British came up what we call Nutum Nutum Jilong Karayo, which uh, nowadays is called Port Phillip Bay, um, they noted the condition of this landscape being basically a giant park. This land was expertly managed with generations of wisdom. Fire was our main land management tool. It regenerated country and opened it up for the different habitats uh, that, for our resources that we thrived off. The smoking ceremony is more about our spirituality. Now we call it Morup, your spirit. When you walk through the smoke of burning leaves, you are symbolising cleansing of spirit and of the area that you're meeting on. Now, I, I can't light fires up here on stage, so I won't be doing it tonight, but I'd just like to say, to feel truly welcome to our sacred land, you must respect people, country and culture. I feel that respect on behalf of my community by be, being invited here to do a welcome to country for you. So I'd like to say, we're Minjika Wallanjeti Bik, welcome to Wurundjeri country, and uh, you know, Science Week is gonna be one amazing week, and I hope it's really successful for you. So thank you. Thanks, Uncle Bill. A big thank you to Uncle Bill. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, a couple of our guests tonight. Uh, Dr. Tian Q, uh, right here, and also Victoria's lead scientist, Dr. Amanda Cables. Could you please make them both feel welcome? Now, of course, we are meeting in the hallowed halls of the Melbourne Museum. Uh, I hope you've all had the opportunity to 
come here before now. I remember my first time uh, on News Breakfast, I arrived at five o'clock in the morning. It was very dark. And uh, somebody put a large bug on me and it was the best time I'd ever had in a museum at five o'clock in the morning. Uh, to, <laughs> to introduce you to the museum tonight, I'd like to invite Dr. Nurin Vies to the stage. Hey, welcome everybody. Welcome to Melbourne Museum. Welcome to Museums Victoria. Um, as Nate said, I'm the Director of Research and Collections here. Definitely want to acknowledge these marvellous lands that we're gathering on. The lands of the Bunwurrung and Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nations, as Uncle mentioned, and acknowledging the Elders, past, present, and the exciting vision that we can have of them emerging in the future. We're gathering very much in this space where we host the Bunjalaka Aboriginal Cultural Centre as well as part of Melbourne Museum. And we definitely do acknowledge that histor historical and living significance of Australia's first peoples as the first scientists on this continent. There are so many people to acknowledge. Also Creative Victoria, the museum's Victoria board, our honourable members of parliament who are here today, our lead scientist Amanda Caples, and of course, many, many people, members of our science communities, our education communities, government, industry bodies, and of course, many of you from the general public who really make this week come alive and make it all the exciting event that we know this week is going to be. Some of you are aware of um, Melbourne Museum that you are here with, and we're part of a broader organisation called Museums Victoria, and we are under a broad organisation, umbrella organisation that represents not just this place, but science works that many of you will know if you are science fans, Immigration Museum, and right behind you, the Royal Exhibition Buildings, which is one of the very few World Heritage um, hi historic buildings here in Australia. This event really focuses on a suite of spectacular events that will be playing out at many different places across Victoria and Melbourne this week. Here we will be focusing many activities, so I hope that you will come again over the weekend to see what we show here. What I would like to point out to you is that Museums Victoria is not just a place where we showcase exhibitions and the collections that we have. We actively, day to day, undertake research here in these very walls. Not only do we do things like discover new species, inform conservation programs, even describe new minerals, as well as highlighting the broad gamut of ways in which we try to make sense of this universe, which includes looking at our histories and the many, many different cultures that tell stories all over time in this extraordinary place that we now live on in this planet. It is a great pri privilege, I said in a tongue-tied manner. Let me say it again. It is a great privilege to host you here all on this site and welcome you to celebrate the spectacular National Science Week. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jim. Awesome. Well, I, I suspect we may have done just about enough talking. I'm very, very hungry to get National Science Week underway. And so is Victoria's lead scientist, Dr. Amanda Cable. So I think we definitely need her to get up onto the stage. Let's get this week started, ladies and gentlemen. Victoria's lead scientist. Thanks very much, Nate, and good evening, everyone. Well, it is really, really exciting to be here tonight. I wish you could see the view from my position because we've got a room full of very excited and happy people who are waiting to hear from our panel. So I'll just make a very uh, few short remarks and uh, I'd like to acknowledge um, the uh, distinguished guests uh, in the audience uh, this evening, and also to thank Uncle Bill uh, for his welcome to country. And, you know, what a year it's been uh, for recognition of Indigenous science. 
with uh, the proliferation of different programs that are now available to celebrate Indigenous science and, of course, Bujbim uh, being uh, acknowledged as part of world heritage. I thought, and I think it was from Uncle Bill, but it might have been someone else, who actually taught me something uh, last year about Wumanjika. Wumanjika is actually a term that is used to welcome people to country and, and represents, if I'm correct, and you and feel free to correct me, um, is about coming with purpose. And, and I think it's a beautiful expression and one that really signifies what we're here tonight to do. We come, everyone in this room, we come with purpose, which is to celebrate science, to translate science and make it real for people and apply it for the better of our culture. So um, for that reason, I'm delighted to support National Science Week uh, in 2019 and, and forevermore for that matter. Um, Science Week is an important festival for Victoria and Australia because it's a festival for everybody. Because science cuts across boundaries, cultural boundaries, gender boundaries, age boundaries, and is the great enabler of thought, new ideas and leadership. And what a fabulous program uh, that we have for you here in Victoria this year. We have galleries of the moon in Geelong and Gippsland. We have coffee in space in Shepparton and in Wodonga. We have First Nations people storytelling in the cosmos. And you can find science everywhere in Victoria this week. We have more than 400 events, so there are many opportunities for our Victorian community to share in and discover the excitement uh, of, sci of the scientific endeavour. And of course, such a program just doesn't happen by itself. Without the support of people across the Victorian community, in metropolitan Melbourne and right across regional Victoria, and I'd like to, there are many, many, many people who've been involved in setting up the programs this week, but I really would like to acknowledge the Royal Society of Victoria for the work that they have done in coordinating National Science Week uh, here in this state. And of course, the best way that you can express your appreciation of the effort that has gone into this program is, um, is by enjoying, registering and enjoying as many events as possible over the next eight days. And of course, all of these programs are available on the Inspiring Victoria website, so go there uh, and, and see what else you can register for and enjoy. So we're in, a, in for a very special treat this evening and I'm looking forward to hearing from the panel and also our very special um, guests, uh, Dr Darlene Lim. And, uh, and I now declare National Science Week in Victoria officially launched. In Happy Science Week. Thank you so much. All right, so we're finally there. Thank you very much, Amanda. It's National Science Week, people. Look, some of us have been ready for National Science Week since very, very early this morning, including myself, but not just me. Did anybody manage to watch News Breakfast this morning and see Darlene Lim on the screen? Didn't she speak beautifully? And if you didn't see her this morning on News Breakfast, you may have seen her at any time during the day because... ABC has been running that interview literally all day. That's how good it was. Darlene is, uh, she gets to do, uh, I do my dream job. Darlene does the job that I dream about in my dreams. She works with NASA Ames. Uh, she goes to the wildest places on earth, the most extreme places on earth to figure out stuff about some of the most extreme places off our Earth. It's incredible science at the extreme that Darlene does, and I would like to invite her to the stage, Dr. Darlene Lim. Thank you for being up with me this morning. <laughs> 
So good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for your time. I'm just so excited to be here and support National Science Week. It is really a remarkable endeavor that your nation puts on. And thank you again for hosting me. Um, so let's go to the first slide. So I only get a short few minutes, as do the other speakers, to kind of explain a lifetime's worth of work. And I hope my life keeps going and that, you know, this gets to increase in terms of the slide length. So it goes on hundreds and hundreds of slides. Um, but fundamentally what I do is I work in a, in, a, in a world where I get to work with scientists, with technologists, with operations researchers, with astronauts, with people from a bevy of different social sciences. And we come together because we all have this vision of sending humans back to the moon and then onwards to Mars. And we are truly working on this with gusto and with excitement. Uh, we are living in a very exciting time right now. So um, let's move forward. As some of you may have heard about in the news, we are, uh, NASA is aiming to send humans back to the moon in 2024. And then that is not the start of the end. You know, we're not intending to go once and then stop there. The intention is to actually begin in 2024 and then continue that journey, that epic journey over many, many years and create a permanence of our humanity on that particular destination on the moon. And then we don't stop there. The idea is to then go forward onwards to Mars. And that will be an incredible journey as well for those first few humans as well as the humans that continue that journey over the many years that follow. So what is my job? So my background is actually in science, and I am a scientist, and when I went to NASA, I went there to try and do one thing, which is, which is to imbue all of the designs and the mission elements with science. And these are human missions, human robotic missions that we're putting together, architectures that are coming together for this journey back to the moon and then onwards to Mars. And, um, Sometimes science becomes a bit of an afterthought when we engineer. And so what I'd like to see is that we put it at the forefront, that it's part of the conversation when we design, when we innovate for these, for these journeys. And these journeys will see humans, as I mentioned, go to the moon and go onwards to Mars for long periods of time. So you can't expect them to entertain themselves simply by planting a flag. They have to go there and they have to do a lot of things, set up infrastructure. And my hope is to do science, to explore as only a human can. And so that is what my work is, and I can't go yet to the moon, I can't go to Mars to test out many of the ideas that we have. So instead, I visit areas on Earth which give us the opportunity to approximate what it might be on some of these planetary targets. And so the work that I've done, it's really built on a heritage of work over time that NASA has done in the preparation for planetary science exploration with humans. Um, so these images, these black and white images here, are some of the preparatory work that we did when the Apollo missions were coming together. Astronauts who were part of the Apollo mission were taken out into the field all over the world to prepare themselves for the geology, for the work that they would have to do when they landed on the moon. So what we're doing today really, you know, harkens back to that time. And now we work in what are called research analogs. So again, these, these areas on Earth that are approximations of different destinations we find in our solar system. And right now, of course, everybody's excited about the Moon and Mars. Um, so we work in all sorts of environments from pole to pole. We work in deserts, we work in aquatic environments, and in each case, each one of these environments offers us the opportunity to look at the questions, at the problems associated with sending humans back to the moon and onwards to Mars from different angles, and to twist and to turn it around and to come at it with a science mind, with an operations mind, and what I do is I try to bring those two worlds together and, and really look at the problem from a bunch of different angles, but primarily with the motivation of ensuring that science is part of the initial designs and conversations. And one of the questions that we're contending with is the idea of communication delay. So when we actually send a signal from the Earth to Mars as an example, because of the way of the, the planets are far apart and because of the way that they sort of align themselves relative to each other, there can be a delay ranging from a few minutes all the way up to you know, 20 minutes, 40 minutes, and that can cause a lot of issues when it comes to trying to have a dialogue with a human being in the future. And so what we have been doing is actually simulating these communication delays in a variety of different environments. So as I was talking about, you can have a four and a half minute delay if the planets are fairly closely aligned, all the way to about a 20 minute one way delay, 40 minute return. Um, and so what that means is that if I say hello to somebody over here, you won't actually hear me say that for four
four and a bit minutes. And then when you receive it, you'll have to think, well, what do I want to say back to her? And by that time, I'm kind of twiddling my thumbs on the surface of Mars, um, putting myself in further harm's way as I wait for your, for your response. So everything on Earth is actually optimized for the speed of light, for the fast transmission of information. When we go back to the moon, we're going to be looking at anywhere from about a 1.6 second delay from when we send a signal to when it's received on the moon up to about 30 seconds. And this is because when we actually send signals from the moon back to Earth, we actually have to pass it through an entire architecture, what's called the deep space network, and a network of different servers and so forth here on Earth. And as you aggregate all of that time spent passing information, it can go as high as 30 seconds. So what you're seeing here is a simulated animation of me saying hello on Earth to somebody on Mars. And so what we're simulating here is about six minutes worth of transmission time. So if this kept going, it would go past the end of my talk before the person on Mars actually got that hello. So this type of problem in terms of communicating with somebody on Mars in a way which is meaningful when they're out there exploring is something we've been exploring in our projects. We have been working out in different field settings, so areas on Earth that approximate Mars, primarily in Idaho and Hawaii most recently, and we've been working in this volcanic settings. We set up um, mission controls in, the, in some of the military camps in the Hawaii area, and then we have field teams that go out acting as astronauts, and they're doing science and science that has to feed back to graduate students and postdoctoral researchers for their careers to flourish. So we cannot fake the science. There is no room for failure around the science and the science that we conduct in the field. But what we simulate are the mission conditions that happen, that we can imagine happening when you have people on Earth, scientists predominantly, feeding information to those that are on Mars. And then we simulate the time delay between the Earth and Mars one way, for example, five minutes or up to 15 minutes one way, so 30 minutes return or 10 minutes return. Um, and we have analyzed all of the uh, different variety of, uh, of things that we wanted to look at in terms of the impact of this delay on our lives. And one of the main questions that we had for ourselves as we went into this endeavor was whether or not we could affect a scientifically driven EVA, extravehicular activity, while it was happening. This was an outstanding knowledge gap in the world of NASA. We didn't know if we could when these time delays become, then when they take hold. And one of the prevailing thoughts was that you could not, you would have to leave the astronauts to their own devices. We actually found out after researching this for four years that you could. And it takes, there's a lot of devil in the detail elements and it takes a lot of designing and engineering, but you can actually manage through this and have a meaningful conversation. And all of the research um, that we have comes out in reports. Recently we put out um, what's called a peer-reviewed academic journal, 13 different papers, a collection of science, operations, research, and technology that kind of sums, sums up um, in more detail what I just uh, described. We tested a lot of different capabilities in the field in support of science. The, we looked at mixed reality capabilities. So this is actually a virtual reality rendering of our field site that we gave to the scientists before the astronauts, our, our simulated astronauts, walked out into the field. We enabled them, these are their avatars that you see that they would have seen of their friends. So this is actually a lens, let's say, of me looking through a VR lens and seeing my friend actually bending down in the frame of view. We could walk around as virtual avatars of the field site before the EVAs occurred at our different field sites and actually simulate what we thought was going to happen before the EVAs happened. We use this as a training tool as well as a way to get ourselves prepared um, intellectually for the endeavor. We also enabled our simulated astronauts to get a, a different type of VR experience. What you see in front of you is actually a virtual path that's been planned for this astronaut, and she's looking at it through what's called a hollow lens. So um, we had an algorithm that was developed by some folks at MIT um, out in Boston, which took into account this woman's metabolic capacity. So how fit was she? How, how able was she to clamber over these very rough terrain areas? We took into account in that algorithm as well the topography of the landscape, how it went up and down, and we put that all together, and then the algorithm generated the best path forward for her. This is the Google Earth for astronauts of the future, or the Google Maps, I should say. And so she could basically walk that path and be guaranteed a pretty safe passage based on all of the different um, elements that we put into that algorithm. And she saw that virtually in front of her with that hollow lens. So, 
A lot of people think mixed reality is cool. A lot of people have told us it's cool. We actually wanted to test out scientifically how cool it is. And we found out it's pretty cool. So <laughs> we're going to write a paper on that. It's going to be coming out this fall. Um, and you'll see that data at that point. So this is my last slide. I wanted to come back to some of the um, images that I showed you early on, the fact that we conduct analog research on land, as well as in a variety of different en environments, including underwater. I've had the privilege of working um, in the deep ocean with the, with the Nautilus, which is a NOAA vessel, a federally funded vessel in the US. We have a ROV, a remotely operated vehicle, that sends signals up from the sea floor, and then that's transmitted back to a mission support center um, on land. And so this is called telepresence, the ocean faring community in the US in, the, in these federal funded situations, federally funded situations, they will actually use telepresence to engage different scientists on shore. And so what we did is we, we basically optimized, um, or we, we used this, this telepresence environment as a means to understand other architectures that we can put in place in the future when it comes to human exploration of Mars. So um, one idea is that you would not immediately have humans land on the surface of Mars, you would actually have them orbit around Mars and control robots on the surface of Mars. So the people orbiting Mars could have quick control responses to these robots, but have a much lengthier um, delay and communication delay with the Earth. So we use the telepresence setup of the NOAA vessel, the Nautilus, as a means to experiment with this new architecture. So again, looking to the Earth to learn about fu the future. So I'll pause there, and um, I think that is the very last slide. So thank you very much, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Darlene. Wow. Who would have thought that scientists would eventually write a paper that says that mixed virtual reality is cool? That's also, I think that goes in the list of like the yeah, duh, but thank you for doing it because then we can insist on it, right? Um, I have another amazing speaker for you this evening. Now, uh, our next speaker goes to similar places that Darlene goes to those wildest, harshest places. But she does it not necessarily with a view up and out in the first case, but down and in, into the bones of the earth to understand how we've gotten here and where we're going next. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Kate Selway. melting. These are some of the most extreme places on the planet. The highest, the driest, the coldest. Flying over somewhere like this, this is the East Antarctic ice sheet. It's almost overwhelming. For hundreds of kilometres, as far as the eye can see, everywhere you look, it's just ice. It's spectacularly beautiful, but it's also totally barren. It's completely inhospitable to human life. These are not places that we are supposed to be. But obviously it's really important that we understand these places. We need to know how fast the ice sheets are melting and we need to understand how they behave. And to do that, we have to go there. And this is, this is what I've done a lot throughout my career. Um, and for the past couple of months, um, I, I spent in this place, this is East Grip Camp. Um, this is a little dot of civilization sitting on the top of the middle of the Greenland ice sheet. It's hundreds of kilometers from any, anywhere else. It's about 2,700 meters elevation, and 2,500 meters of that is ice just two and a half kilometres of ice all the way down until you hit the bedrock. The main scientific goal at East Grip Camp is to drill an ice core to the base of the ice sheet. So there are ramps and tunnels going beneath the ice surface to an ice drill, and then these full scientific laboratories where scientists conduct experiments on the ice core as it's coming up then and there. And the reason that it's important to drill an ice core right here is because East Grip sits on a huge ice stream, really a big glacier. And it's really 
disconcerting to be there and to know that every day you're moving about that far closer to the ocean. And these ice streams are a really huge way that, that the ice sheets lose a lot of ice, not only from melting, but from ice flowing out towards the ocean in ice streams and glaciers. And this is the first ever ice core that's been drilled on an ice stream so that we can understand exactly how the ice is flowing in these places and why the ice is flowing there and not in other places. For me, for my research, I'm looking beneath the ice even deeper into the earth. So I'm a geophysicist and I'm interested in the upper mantle. So that's the uppermost few hundred kilometres of the earth. And this is important in the poles because the ice sheets are a huge weight sitting on the surface of the earth. And the earth depresses beneath the ice sheets and bulges out around the sides. It's kind of like a person sitting on a mattress. And when the ice sheets melt, just like that person getting up off the mattress, the earth rebounds as that weight is lost. And this happens really slowly, there's a delay, and it can take thousands of years for the Earth to rebound. And beneath Greenland and Antarctica, we don't know how quickly the Earth is rebounding beneath those ice sheets. And this is really important because we need to know this to know exactly how much ice is being lost from the ice sheets. So to measure how much ice is being lost, we take measurements of the elevation of the top of the ice sheet, and as the ice melts, the elevation goes down. But in those measurements, there's also this signal from the Earth's surface rebounding. And we don't know how big that is, and so that's giving us an uncertainty in knowing exactly how much ice is being lost. So it's really important that we know how quickly the Earth is rebounding to get accurate measurements of ice loss. And this is what I'm working on at the moment. So, we don't go down under the ice with the drillers, we drive out on snow scooters hundreds of kilometres away from station. In environments like this where, as for hour and hour after, for hour after hour as you're driving, the horizon is totally flat and totally featureless. And it's only through your GPS that you have any idea of what direction you're going in and even how fast you're going. And then when we arrive at a place, we know for certain that we are the first human beings who've ever stood on that part of the Earth. To collect our data, we deploy some geophysical instruments. Uh, we're measuring, deploying magnetometers that measure the Earth's magnetic field and electric dipoles that measure electric fields in the Earth. And then I take these data and use them to calculate how electrically conductive the Earth is and then eventually to calculate then how quickly it's rebounding beneath these ice sheets. This is a big project. We need to make these measurements and see how this earth rebound varies across all of Greenland. So we'll be going back over the next few years and try to get an array that covers as much of the ice sheet as possible. For me, as somebody who's interested in these big processes in the earth, one of the really great things about my research is that I get to go to all sorts of different places in the, in the world where the Earth is doing interesting things. And one of those places, really different from the poles, is East Africa. In East Africa, the Earth is actually tearing the continent apart. It's rifting Africa into what will one day be two separate continents. And this again produces lots of really extreme environment in East Africa. The lakes there are some of the deepest in the world, and these are really gashes in the Earth's surface. There are active volcanoes, there are these amazing high savanna plains, and these big Earth processes there have also created some of the most fertile land on the planet, land that helped modern humans develop. And also for us, when we're trying to deploy our instruments, land that allows a lot of animals to develop. So our, our biggest challenge in East Africa is actually finding a spot we can deploy our instruments where a herd of goats isn't going to come along and chew everything to bits. One of the best ways to get around this uh, is to deploy in national parks, but then it is a little bit disconcerting going to sleep at night in your tent and hearing the lions start to roar. So one of the ways, one of the things that I love most about working in East Africa is so that we get around this actually mainly by working in schools and deploying our stations in schools. And it's a great way then to get the school kids involved in our science 
and we can explain to them a little bit about what we're doing and talk to them about this absolutely incredible place in the world that they live. But I think even with this, uh, even with lions in Africa and very, very cold temperatures on ice sheets, I actually think of all the extreme places that I've worked in the world, I think actually here in Australia is the most extreme. Even when we're on an ice sheet in Greenland, if our snow scooters break down or somebody injures themselves, there's a lot of infrastructure there to look after us. There's a doctor and a mechanic at camp who can come and help us. And at worst situation, a helicopter evacuation is only a phone call away. Whereas here in Australia, you could be in the middle of WA, hundreds of kilometres from any other human being, and you could roll your car or you could get trapped by a flash flood, and you're really quickly in, in really big trouble. And to be honest, I think that it's the skills that I learned, even as a PhD student here, having to do really meticulous planning and be very self-sufficient for field work here in Australia that's then allowed me to go to these other places in the world and do field work successfully and safely. And the other thing that's struck me in all these places, no matter how extreme they are, and I'm really interested to see how this relates to when humans go to the moon and to Mars, is no matter how extreme the environment is, once people get there, we very quickly make it home. Even if it's just a tent and a book and a burner, we immediately find a way to push the extreme outside and make a place for ourselves that's comfortable and cosy and safe, and for us humans, then feels like home. Thanks. Okay, so I'm very rapidly learning that severe in terms of severe weather means different things from severe in terms of severe earth places. Some of you might not know, I'm also an oceanographer as well as a meteorologist. Uh, it's very similar, weather in the atmosphere, weather in the ocean, it's all fluids. Uh, the next person we're going to hear from does a very similar thing uh, to Kate. She, she looks down and in, but instead of in through the earth, she looks in through the ocean to find some of perhaps the, the least known and the most mysterious creatures and is in a desperate race to try to catalogue them to figure out who they are what they are and how they do what they do before us up here change what's happening down there. Diane Bray. Um, thank you, Nate, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to um, Melbourne Museum. Before I start, I just want to say you're in one of these hallowed places or one of these very special places that holds natural history collections. These are the libraries of life, past, present and hopefully future. The really important collections that continue to give up their stories hundreds of years after they were collected, such as the thylacine. The uh, thylacine genome was sequenced from a little pup that we have in our collection that we acquired in 1909. So our museum collections are incredibly important. It's incredibly important that we continue to develop them. And my aim is to try, I am involved in, in collections. I'm a fish person, but I am a senior collection manager. And I try to develop collections so that the people who are around now, but the people who aren't yet born, can ask questions about our biodiversity and how it's changing um, over time, especially at a time when humans are having such an impact on the planet. Okay, let's get into the deep sea. I just want to see that, that slide there. A couple of years ago, I was lucky enough to be on a, the investigator off Eastern Australia, um, surveying biodiversity from mostly from about 2,000 metres down to 4,000 metres. Uh, we, our deepest shot was, I think, 4,008 100 metres, and that's a seafloor map of the East Gippsland um, Commonwealth Marine Reserve, the first time that was actually mapped. So the Earth's surface is mostly ocean, occupies, and the deep sea occupies half of the world's um, oceans. We've only mapped um, very little of it, 
Um, it's the largest and least known environment on the planet. Um, the deepest part of that ocean is the Mariana Trench. And there are mountains taller than Everest and obviously very, very deep trenches. And we know so little about it, especially off Australia. Especially off Australia. We have the third largest EEZ in the world. I think we've only mapped the seafloor and about 25% of the, um, Australia's EEZ. And you can see that that map there, if you can see that tiny red line around the map there, that is actually Australia's EEZ, excluding um, our subantarctic and Antarctic waters. Going right out into the Tasman Sea, we've got Cocos and Christmas Island um, in the Eastern Indian Ocean. And prior to that survey that we were on in a couple of years ago, there'd only been two stations below, two survey stations below 2,000 metres off Eastern Australia. And one of those was taken in 1876 or 75 during the voyage of the HMS Challenger, the first round the World Oceanographic Voyage. So the deep sea is an extremely difficult um, environment to sample. Crushing pressures, really, really cold temperatures. It's dark, light drops out below 1,000 metres and you have to have a very clear, clear water and a bright sun to get light to, trans, uh, to travel that far down in the bottom. And this little food, it's the life down there is based on food that comes down from above. And no fishes live below 8,400 metres. There are invertebrates, the Hadal amphipod, I think has been collected from about 10,300 metres, but no fishes occur below 8,400 metres. And they think that it, the pressures, every 10, um, the pressures, the fresh pressure at 4,000 metres is 400 atmospheres. So you increase depth and the pressures are so um, extreme that the, science, the researchers now think that those pressures affect the way the proteins in um, fish tissue works. They don't know how the um, amphipods and things work down there, but certainly no fishes have been found below 8,370 metres, which is the deepest fish, that abyssal brotula. Life down in those depths as we go down through the twilight zone, the zone where the light gradually disappears out. In that zone, it's uh, filled with bioluminescence, it's filled with fishes with fangs, lots of crustaceans that are red. Red is the new black in the deep sea because as you go down from the surface layers, the long wave, wave length, length, length the, the reds and the violets disappear, so you just retain the blues. So the vast majority of animals in the deep ocean can't see red. They've lost the ability to see red because um, red doesn't appear down there. You know that if you see um, videos of the Great Barrier Reef, unless somebody's shining a light on those corals, they essentially appear bluish. But there is one group of fishes, the, the loose jaws, a fish called Malacosteus and its relatives, four species, I think, that actually can see red and they actually shine a red light. They can shine a light on their prey and maybe they feed on these red crustaceans. So they can actually perceive red light, so they can shine a light on their red prey. Nothing else can see that light. And so that adaptation is amazing. And the amazing thing about the loose jaw is that it's got um, jaws that swing out like a praying mantis with big teeth. You think it would be a fish eater, but most of the stomach contents contain copepods. And the visual pigments in the retina actually match the chlorophyll pigments in the copepod prey. And that's how they think that um, Malacosteus can actually, um, has actually been able to see the red light. One of the other things, um, fishes down in that twilight zone have often um, eyes that have special adaptations to be able to make the most of the tiny little light that comes in there. And reproductive strategies, fish cover everything. Most reef fish change sex, some male to female, others female to male, some little tiny gobies that live within corals can change sex one way and depending on who makes the, they, a pair lives in a tiny little coral, um, they can then ch reverse their sex back the other way. But down in the twilight zone, the deep sea anglerfishes, the ceratioid anglerfishes, um, have the most extreme version of sexual dimorphism. The males, you can see down the bottom here, the males are tiny little things and in some families the males actually permanently attach to the females if they're lucky to find one. One of the other things, you've seen those deep sea tripod fishes, those amazing fishes that stand up on their, on their fins on the abyssal plain, facing into the current as they feed. They are simultaneous hermaphrodites, so they have reproductive male and female tissue at the same time. They have an ovotestis. Some research has shown that the testis part of that always has sperm in it, but that there aren't always eggs present because it takes a lot of energy to make eggs, so maybe they can only do that when they've had a big feed and food's scarce, so maybe that doesn't happen very often.
Um, I just want to put this slide up with Ophiroids because the investigator trip that we were on a few years ago, and a number of us here were on that, our echinoderm curator, Tim O'Hara, got a grant to go on the investigator for a month. So we were away for a month, and Tim is mapping the distribution of Ophiroids around the, around the world, brittle stars. And brittle stars are a fantastic organism for him to work on because every time you put a collecting gear on the bottom of the ocean, no matter how deep, you get brittle stars. They come up in every trawl. In fact, sometimes they come up in trawls, just so many of them that you don't want to see another one. But also, the other fantastic thing about brittle stars is that they've been preserved in ethanol. Most of the fishes prior to the 1980s and most many other animals were fixed in formalin, embalming fluid, which binds DNA. It makes it very difficult to get DNA out of formal and fixed material. It can be done, but it's a very difficult and expensive process. Whereas brittle stars, because formalin is acidic and it would destroy the, the skeleton of the um, echinoderms, they were always put straight into ethanol. So Tim, th these amaz amazing libraries around the world, these amazing museums that have these libraries of life, Tim's been able to get tissue samples from these ophiuroids that are held in the museums around the world to develop um, distributional maps of what species live where and do use next generation sequencing to um, work out phylogenies and also evolutionary histories of brittle stars. Um, I just want to mention the Challenger voyage I mentioned before. First round the world voyage went from 1872 to 1876 for about three and a half years from Plymouth in the UK. They had a board, um, and so we were on the investigator, this high-tech computerized ship, your ship, my ship, with multi-beam sonar that could map the seafloor, and we always map the seafloor before we put any gear down there because the gear's expensive. We don't want it to get snagged on rocks and the seafloor, as you saw in that very first slide of the East Gippsland CMR, has canyons and 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 gullies and things. And it's um, on our trip off Eastern Australia, we found that the abyssal plain wasn't smooth in part. There were many many rocks and structures that we had to be aware of when we put gear down. The Challenger had 144 miles of hemp rope, so they would use that rope to take depth soundings. So their depth sounding was a 100 pound weight that they would drop off the side, and the deepest depth sound they were was in the Mariana Trench down to 8,200 metres. They had 12.5 miles of piano wire on board, which they would put their sampling equipment down on, and every few weeks they would put all that wire out. And the illustrations of those fishes there are the same species, some of the same species that are found in Australia's waters. So, so some of our fauna was first collected during the voyage of the Challenger in 1875. Amazing. And these are some of the deep sea fishes that uh, live in our waters. Um, the one on the top left hand corner is actually one of the ones that lives in the twilight zone. It's um, a dragonfish, big light organ on the side, that's a male. The males have really, really big light organs, so they communicate with light to each other, and they not only use it to shine a light on prey, but they also communicate. Um, and the rest are all sorts of things. Um, the cute little one on the top, hand, top side, a um, little coffin fish came up bright red from 2,500 metres, bright red, um, because no animals down there can see red. So, and we thought that maybe that was new, but no, DNA sequences show it's the same species as off California and also occurs in the um, Central Pacific. One of the other wonderful things we caught was the faceless cusk. Uh, we thought we'd won the jackpot with that when it came up until we actually, uh, John Poganowski, a colleague of ours, um, identified it from a book and it wasn't on our radar because it was first collected on the voyage of the Challenger in the Coral Sea just outside Australia's EEZ. So it wasn't on our radar as, as a fish that actually lived in Australia's waters. And I just love that, that um, video from NOAA because we get these animals, they've come up from 4,000 metres. We ended up collecting three specimens, I think. You know, you come up from 4,000 metres, it's dead. Um, extreme pressures and the temperature gets them as well. Um, and to actually see what they look like alive is actually fantastic. And one of the other things we collected was rubbish from way down deep. Clinker, which is um, a build-up that occurs in old steam engines, so we, we collected lots of clinker. We were working in ancient shipping lanes, but also paint cans and rope and plastic and tins. And um, one of the researcher board was looking at microplastics, so Phoebe was sampling the, the um, surface waters to look at microplastic and microfibers, but also looking at mud that was collected from way down at the bottom to see what plastics were down there. 
And I just want to end with this beautiful video of fan-fished anglerfish, um, one of the things in the twilight zone, to show that if you look very carefully, you can see a little attached male to the, to the fish. This was actually filmed off the, uh, the Azores in the Atlantic. Uh, the same species occurs in Australian wars, and I've seen one that came up as a tiny little thing with these fine little fins um, of it. But to see that you can see, um, you could see her lure, her fishing lure, bioluminescent. She has these amazing um, fins that she spreads out with little bioluminescent bits along the way. Maybe she's looking like a siphonophore. Lots of siphonophores live in those, um, in those twilight zone waters that have bioluminescence. So I just wanted to end with that. Um, it's just lovely for us to see when we work on our museum collections and so people see them as dead things in jars, but they're actually, to me, you know, these wonderful libraries of life. To actually see these animals alive is fantastic. So thank you very much for coming here tonight. And if you want to find out more about Australia's fishes, there's a website, fishesaustralia.net.au. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Okay, so... I, uh, in a previous life, I may have mentioned it, was a naval officer, um, and uh, used to go swimming off the ship from time to time. We'd get the opportunity to jump in and go deep. And the scientist in me always looked down when we did that into the inky black depths. And I was like, what's down there? Diane, such beautiful things is the answer. Um, I've come with my wine. Now, the reason I've come with my wine is because I think that uh, as good as, as the three talks we've just heard were, I think we need a bit more. And also, it's National Science Week, so, so it's time to get a bit relaxed while I uh, ask for Diane, Kate... Uh, <laughs> wait, wait, just calm yourself down. And of course, Dr Lim to join us back on the stage. Please make them welcome. It's Science Week, people. All right, because I want to have a chat. Um, I, wow, thank you, all three of you, so much for joining us tonight. And uh, I, I always feel like, like the science I do is pretty cool, but uh, way to put a dude in his place. Uh, <laughs> Darlene, I want to start talking uh, to you first, if, if you don't mind, just since you've been up since stupid o'clock this morning. Yeah, okay. Well, <laughs> we'll get you off and to bed soon. Um, I know that you, you work all over the place. You talk really interestingly about a place that I think we're all familiar with, the Atacama Desert, and about how it isn't just a desert in terms of humidity, but also in terms of life, about how a, like void of bacterial life it is for a large part. And now that you're reaching out to Mars, I think one of the things most people like, are romantically interested is in is the thought of life on Mars. And I know when you went to the Atacama, you found life ridiculously quickly. Mm. What do you reckon about Mars? Is this on? Great. Nice um, and close. You're absolutely right. So um, we've been to deserts all over the world and they surprise us at all turns. I think others can speak to this. Um, there are pockets which are habitable, which tend to be areas where life can take hold and actually become quite diverse and the communities can be very, you know, complex. Um, and so when we see this, when we go out to places like the Atacama that are being put forward as Mars analogs, it definitely gives us an incredible springboard um, from which we can, you know, extrapolate and um, perhaps think about what might be possible in somewhere like Mars. So Mars, we know there was liquid water on the surface of that planet at, at some point in time for quite a bit of time. And um, so there are possibilities that there were zones of habitability. We can't get there yet to do an extensive search, but we've done quite a search, whether it's from satellite imagery or actually with the robotic missions that have been there. And there's been enough evidence that has come back that the idea of searching for life on Mars, and, or I should say past life on Mars, is not ridiculous. Um, there's also been, of course, extensive bodies of Mars analog work that examine this question, as you mentioned, in places like the Atacama and elsewhere. And also, again, the conclusion is it's not a ridiculous proposition. So I think that pathway has been laid out before us, and it's going to be really exciting to see what happens next. I cannot wait <laughs> myself, by the way. Uh, when, I, when I said that you have the actual dream job of my dreams, I, I, there was no exaggeration there. 
Kate, I want to talk to you because uh, this week, well, in the past week, we've seen the effects from a huge uh, heat wave across Europe and perhaps unprecedented, certainly in recorded history, uh, a huge melt through many of the glaciers in the north. Uh, billions of tonnes of, of frozen water have been lost. What does that do to you beyond just climate catastrophe, but you as a scientist doing the work you do? How, how does that affect your work? Yeah, and actually, whilst I was there in Greenland earlier this year, um, we, I was there quite early in the summer. So when I f arrived, it was late May, and it was about minus 25 degrees, which is about the temperature it should be in the summer. Um, and only oh, a week or 10 days later, it really warmed up. And we were, we were out deploying a station. And we were saying to each other, geez, it's a bit warm today. Yeah. And actually our snow scooters, we had to stop and let them cool down for a while because the plastic covering on the kind of the bonnets of the snow scooters started to melt. Because um, they're not designed to operate at those temperatures. Exactly, they, they want it to be minus 30 degrees. Yeah. Um, and when we got back to camp, actually discovered that that day it had got to, got above freezing, it got to 0.4 of a degree, which was totally unprecedented. That, that early in the summer, there had never been recorded temperatures that warm in the centre of the Greenland ice sheet. And it was, it was really strange. As I say, you're, you're standing on two and a half kilometres of ice. There's hundreds of kilometres of ice around you in every direction. To be in that place, and last week it was minus 25, and then today the surface is starting to get slippery as the snow is melting. Just extraordinary, and, and it, it feels wrong. I mean, it shouldn't be happening. Well, this is ice that's been frozen for a very long yeah, time. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, the whole Greenland ice sheet's about 120,000 years old. So it's a really long time that this has been stable. Um, and similarly, flying, flying to get to these camps from the coast, and you can see all of these melt pools, certainly towards the edge of the ice sheet, and they're, um, they look extraordinary. They're uh, sort of iridescent, like a popsicle blue. They're an amazing colour. And they just, they cover the edge of the ice sheet. Um, and always in the summer, there's always melt, um, but certainly what's happening now is, is, totally, is totally unprecedented. Um, so it's frightening, I think it's frightening for all of us, um, and for me just makes it feel more and more pressing that, uh, that we, these are questions we really need to figure out and we need to figure them out quickly. Yeah, and on the day that the IPCC re released their, their special report. Uh, Diana, I want to ask you about the signal you see deep down in the ocean from what's happening up here. Not just climate change, but uh, other human impacts as well. Are you concerned that we've already lost a range of species that we'll never even get to know ever existed? Um, I'm certainly not... I don't think that's the case in the deep sea. Um, it's, it's relatively but, untouched but at this I, stage. Well, I, but I think that certainly the um, ice melting certainly affects the currents in the deep sea. You mm. know, I think that the, it, it's the, the poles that affect the drive the current circulation in the deep sea, I think, um, unless I'm mistaken there. So that you will get those sort of effects, but it's a very stable environment down there. You know, it's always cold, there's always high pressures. The same kind, you know, those animals have adapted to that life for an awfully long time. I think Kate might have said the same thing once upon a time. Yes. It's very <laughs> stable. The animals are very secure. But yeah, yeah, carry yeah, on. You know, I think it's, maybe it's the most stable area on the planet. But, mm. you know, certainly, certainly you know, as you, as you get current shifting and as you get ice melting, that's certainly going to change, change maybe the distributions of animals. Mm. Um, but maybe it'll be the last place where climate change does affect the distribution of animals, but it's you know, certainly concerning. Yeah. Darlene, I want to talk about the thing you dream about in your wildest dreams, the work that you do. How, 
Mars, the moon, is all incredibly important stuff. Off-world stuff is incredibly important. But I imagine a lot of your work, the harder stuff you do, has uh, applications right here on Earth. Can you talk about some of the most exciting things that you are hoping for that we will directly benefit from right here, right now? It's a great question. I have a lot of hopes. Um, I guess they're much more humble than you describe because a lot of my job is delayed gratification. And that's <laughs> <laughs> I'm a forecaster, I understand. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I mean, to be perfectly frank, um, like I, I'm not skirting around answering your question. No. I'm going to answer it from my heart, which is uh, we put all this research out there. We, have, we started this research well before we were given a deadline of 2024 because we felt compelled to put it together because we knew that it would happen one day when the you know, political stars were kind of just right. Um, and we also knew that we probably wouldn't get credit immediately for our work, maybe never, maybe, you know, maybe someday, who knows, but it didn't matter. All the people that are working together, we did it because we were compelled to do it out of our interest in seeing it happen. And I think that you guys probably feel that passion and that motivation for your work too. And so in my wildest dreams, we design for science. We put humans in an enabling situation or they are enabled to really do the science and exploration to their best of their ability. And what I mean by that is that we enable humanity to be represented when they walk on the surfaces of these new places. They are allowed to be funny. They're allowed to change their minds. They're allowed to pivot in their decision making just like we do when we go out into the field. They're allowed to deal with stuff that breaks. And if I can somehow enable that process in some small little way, like there's limb written in like three point font somewhere, <laughs> I'm good. I am, you know, yeah. I will roll over in my, my grave and just like laugh and cheer or whatever it may be. And in my wildest, um, I, I don't want to say wildest, but my um, optimistic view is that that will happen sooner than we think. That in the 2030s, we're going to see some really remarkable things. We are living in a new golden age of exploration. Um, there are a lot of different, um, I think, uh, interests coming to play in, this, in the space uh, exploration community from, you know, people like Elon Musk, from Jeff Bezos and so forth. They're pushing the envelope. They're helping all of us push the envelope. So this, these are exciting times and NASA is part of that. And um, so that's what I dream about when I dream. And um, all of the work that we do it's, we're, we're gearing at a very specific vision and the spin-offs that happen, I know they will happen that will benefit us directly, but I'll be totally honest. I mean, my, my hope is that many of the people that are here, you will look on your television screens in 2030 and you will be benefited in your heart by watching this event unfold in front of you. Not necessarily by getting a new iPhone or getting a faster iPhone, you know? But you may Although have, that may also Yeah, happen. you may have that too. Yeah. I don't you know. <laughs> Thank you, you're welcome, you know, but. <laughs> Be like, oh, thanks, darling. Yeah, thank you, thank and you. thanks for that landing thing. Um, yeah, so that's, that's where my mind goes through when, goes to when, you know, you ask that question. Mm. I'd, I'd like to put it out to the room as well. If, if any of you have any questions you'd like to ask our panelists, chuck a hand in the air. I'm more than happy to take a question. So, it, uh, we have a mic actually, look at that. I didn't even know that was a thing. Look at the power of science. Go, sir. <laughs> Let's see if it actually works. Oh, it works. It's amazing. Um, thank you all so much for your presentations and this discussion. It's wonderful. Um, there's a few things that sort of overlap to some extent where we're talking about extreme environments and human impacts. Uh, certainly when we're looking at the, uh, the ocean, the deep ocean, and we're seeing the evidence, of course, of uh, human consumerism um, and plastics in particular reaching those depths, which concerns me a great deal. Uh, at the same time, we're also looking at the, uh, the nascent... Uh, days of, uh, of human exploration in space. And yeah, we're already hearing some reports of you know, tardigrades spilling out over the moon and things like this. How are we going to regulate our activity in these extreme environments, particularly as we move off the Earth, to make sure that we're not repeating the same mistakes we're making on the Earth? Mm, humans have heavy footprints. Uh, um, the, whoever would like to take it first, I think. How do we make sure that we don't make all of the universe know us before we know it. I'm not <laughs> jumping in simply because I think that's a human question and we're all human, so we yeah. could all answer it. Um, but if you'd like, I can jump in. <laughs> Please. Uh, I think we're gonna make the same mistakes. 
We, we have, you know, I was just in Europe this summer, we walked through Rome, we talked about propaganda with some of our guides and how there was propaganda throughout that entire period of time. We're still having propaganda, fake news, et cetera, et cetera. It's the same thing. I, like, I, I don't see us not making the same mistakes, I'll be perfectly honest. I think it would be ridiculous for me to say otherwise. But that's also an opportunity to not necessarily make them in the, in the most unthoughtful way and maybe to catch ourselves sooner and to stop ourselves from making the really bad ones again and again, right? And to be more aware of the fact that we're in this cycle. Um, I think that I've seen, you know, when we go in the field, you see humanity at its best because people are stressed and they are forced to come together and put all of their onion layers to one side, their egos to one side and work together as a team. I have seen that in some pretty um, duress-filled moments. And I love to see that. I'd love to come out on the other side. And I know that will propagate as well, that aspect of humanity onwards, no matter where we go. I, um, I wonder, like, part of doing science is observing. And by observing something, you change it. Right? You're drilling holes in hundreds of thousands of year old ice. You're shining light on animals that have never had light shone on them. How much of that is okay, Kate? I know, big question. No notice, <laughs> crack on. Because <laughs> some of it is necessary, right? Do you know what I, what I am going to say is um, that, that I, I totally agree that, that we're going to make a lot of mistakes and destroy a lot of things. Um, and that's unfortunately just seemingly what humans are like. Um, but that even inadvertently, good can come from that as well. Um, so, actually going to this, this drilling camp this, um, this winter, this summer, uh, it was the first ice drilling camp I've been to, and it was, for me it was fascinating. I learned so much about ice sheet science, it was great. And one of the things that I learned was that the first ice core drilled anywhere, the, the first ice core drilled in Greenland, and it was before any drilled in Antarctica, was drilled um, by the US military during the Cold War. Um, and they set up this camp, it was called Camp Century. There's an amazing propaganda YouTube video that you should all go home and look up. Probably not originally <laughs> on YouTube, right? <laughs> no. But we can find it there no. now. Um, <laughs> and they, they dug under the Greenland ice sheet and built this incredible station powered by portable nuclear reactors. Um, and in part, as part of that, drilled the first ever ice core. Wow. Um, and it was essentially to uh, move nuclear missiles around without the Russians being able to see. So, no good motivations there at all. <laughs> but, but as part of it, they needed to know how the ice moved and behaved so that, actually, they, so they built train tracks to move their missiles around, but they were too close to the edge of the ice sheet, so the ice flowed too much, and within a few months, their train tracks all bend around and they were totally useless. So they had drilled an ice core to understand how the ice moved and try to prevent that, that very thing from happening. <laughs> no, nothing like a bit of <laughs> selfish motivation when it comes to science. Yeah, that's right. Um, and then fortuitously, then that ice core was sitting there. So then when other scientists figured out how to use isotopes to look at climate record from ice sheets, then this, this ice core had just been sitting there for decades, and so that was the first way that people were able to get these climate records from the Greenland ice sheet. So I think in some way that's a story of hope that even, even if we're doing something with no good motivations, that then hopefully, hopefully the good side of humanity prevails in the end, and that even from those bad choices, we can take some good things yeah. and end up progressing from those things. Smart minds can prevail. Mm. Damn. Um, certainly in terms of of, of collecting and, and finding out what's actually living in the ocean. Well, from my perspective, that's really critical. If we don't know what lives there, we don't know how the ecology, how they interact mm -hmm. with each other. Um, we don't know how to manage them. We don't know um, what effects we're having on biodiversity if we don't know it. Um, and it comes back to these you know, museums who've got these records, and, and like that, you know, the same as the ice cores, if you didn't have that from way back, you know, those original ones, you'd be starting from scratch. Um, and, and the collections that museums make are just a tiny 
tiny, tiny little, you know, we're not making species go extinct or whatever. And in the days of the Challenger, there were voyages of discovery. In the days of the, the early collections that we've got, it was voyages of discovery and, you know, total collecting. Um, these days we work with ethics, we have an, an animal care and ethics committee, we work with permits, we have to apply to go on indigenous lands and all, all of those sort of overlayers and we do it on a project base. But, I, but to me it's still really important that we do maintain and develop these collections and maybe we don't need an emu but maybe we need feathers of an emu to mm -hmm. say that emu lived there once and, and maybe it's evolving you know, so much differently from the emus that we've got way back when. And, you know, there is, uh, it's interesting because we take people into our collections and there are jars of dead things and we've got um, bird, beautiful bird skins and birds from New Guinea and, and specimen mounts and some people are confronted by seeing, um, you know, the specimens that we hold. But mm. they're, they're critically important. Like, like I said, they do give up their stories. Now, not every specimen will be used, but they tell us that something, they're snapshots in time. These animals live there at this particular place in time. And also with, um, with DNA techniques, when finding so many cryptic species, one small freshwater fish, a galaxias, in 2014 was shown to be um, 12 species. No. Um, and if we didn't Thank have these God. historic collections, we we wouldn't know that. Mm. All we would have is the written reports in papers. Mm. And that, that's a group of fishes that lives down the Great Dividing Range and there's a species in little streams going towards the coast and different st streams going, species in streams going inland. Um, and some of those are in trouble because we have trout in our waters and they're river foxes. Mm. Um, you know, apart from climate change, these are in high altitude streams. So, you know, if we don't know these, what, what lives where and how it relates to other animals, we don't know how to protect them. Right, so, so what I'm getting is, tread lightly, acknowledge we're going to make mistakes and take advantage of those mistakes when we can. Right, that's, I, I nailed it, all right. Um, <laughs> does anyone else have a, have a question they'd like to ask our amazing panelists? Oh, I, in the back there. Uh, hello, Theresa Mitchell. I'm from Warrigal in Gippsland. Welcome. And hopefully, um, I'm actually hosting Darlene in Warrigal next Tuesday. There so, you go. <laughs> thank you. Um, my question is what is your favourite place? And it was um, around that wow moment in science and how it affected you. Favourite place? Wow moment in science. Go. Wow, okay. <laughs> Please tell me it was at the bottom of some I, deep ocean, no light, uh, some faceless well, thing staring at you. If Australia had a submersible... <gasps> oh. And... Challenge. And, and challenge, yes, please. Um, and I had had the opportunity to go in one. That would probably be my favourite place. But I would have to say, as a very young um, person at the Australian Museum, I got to go on a voyage from Townsville, steaming outside the Outer Barrier and working up to Thursday Island and coming back down in the days when it didn't cost a lot of money to do, re to do trips and we could do collecting in, in pretty much any method that we used. So we were collecting um, shallow water fishes, we were diving, we were throwing, um, we were doing some trawling off the coast. We hit seamounts off eastern Australia, the tops of seamounts. We flew the bottom trawlers and midwater trawls, so we hit the tops of seamounts that hadn't been mapped there. And we caught fishes that hadn't been recorded, new species. And those collections now can't be collected. You know, you, you can't go and do what we did in those days. And it was for a whole month of February, and there was glass to be on a ship going outside the barrier reef, and the only thing that's breaking the water surface are flying fishes. Oh, um, it's just I have done amazing. That. I have done that. You, and then they end have. up on the deck and yes. then if you don't get them quick enough, they stink. Um, yes, I, I know that exact moment when it's, when it's ocean, yeah. like horizon to horizon, yeah. there's nothing. And these amazing flying fish with their counter-shaded bodies, the deep blue on the surface and the silvery white below. Oh. And they, they are just amazing to watch. They take off and they waggle their tails to keep them going. All right, so Diane and I are in fierce agreement. Now, I suspect that you two are going to have to argue over the Arctic tundra or the hottest deserts. Who wants to battle it out? Go, Kate. Do you know, I never... I often think about this just for myself and I never actually can come up with my favourite place and I feel, uh, I mean, to me in all honesty, the, 
I, I love the, my research that I do, and I'm, I love the science, but for me personally, the, the reason I'm most glad that I happen to take this path in life is that it's taken me to so many amazing parts of the world that I wouldn't have got to see otherwise, um, and to have just just ex incredible experiences, um, and I feel extremely lucky for those things. And I think for that reason, I would have to say that for that wow moment, um, my first trip to Antarctica was um, at a, a, an Australian, with, going down with the Australian Antarctic Division um, and working at a base called Davis Station. Um, the whole trip was incredible. You can only get there by boat. So we went on the Aurora Australis, the Australian icebreaker. Um, you sail down and then you eventually get into the sea ice and there's seals and penguins floating around on the sea ice and there's whales and um, eventually you land in Antarctica. We spent, um, because it's a place you can only get to by boat, we were there for the whole summer, we were there for four months until the next boat comes and can take you back home. Um, so after being there for four months, working really, really hard uh, and we were doing a lot of deployments by helicopter flying up. Davis is kind of on the rocks and coastal Antarctica. And so we'd fly up by helicopter each day onto the ice sheet and deploy our stations. Um, and after four months of this, our final flight back to the station was probably 300 kilometres, so a really long flight. Um, and the pilot uh, was a bush pilot from Australia. He was a mustering pilot. Um, so he was a really good pilot and really good at manoeuvring the helicopter. Um, so he, he gave us a really nice flight, um, zooming in these glaciers that are just, just these enormous jumbles of ice, just, uh, just the power of the ice moving in these glaciers is incredible to create just skyscrapers and huge chasms in the ice. Um, so, so I think that for, for the for the wow moment, for the recognition whilst I was doing it, of just the privilege I had to see such a place. And for, you know, you've been working with these, this team of people so closely for such a long time. So then the, the um, like I was saying, the human aspect that, that you're there and it's really then about the people that, that you're there with and these incredible friendships that you've forged as well to then be having this, this experience together. Um, I'd say that's, that's probably it for me. Oh. It's a high bar, darling. <laughs> yeah, okay, go. Please. So my answer to part one is all of the above. I refuse to choose. <laughs> oh, sorry, I've done all that. Yeah, I, it's like choosing which is my favorite child. I cannot yeah. do that. Yeah. So I will not choose my favorite spot. They're all amazing. I've seen sunsets and sunrises all over the world. They were equally as amazing. I've seen the sun never set in the Arctic and the Antarctic. Wow. Equally as amazing. Um, so they're all remarkable. They're all truly remarkable. We live on one planet. It, they're all amazing places. My wow moment, I'll tell you all, like tons of wow moments. One that comes to mind that just happened over the course of this project we were working on called Basalt is um, it was, uh, so we designed this software in order to deal with that time change and help people being simulated um, who were working on Mars and Earth manage their decision making time frame. So if any of you use, for example, iCal, you know, iCalendar, and you've got that red line, the Marcus Bain line, it kind of tells you where, where you are in your day, right? And you have three meetings coming up, whatever. Um, it gives you a marker. So we, we design software that allows people to understand when an EVA is going on, you have to make a decision. Um, and when you have to, and when somebody is out, when they're putting it, when they're pulling out a geology tool or when they're using a spectrometer or whatever, all of those things are sort of time framed out. And then if you're on Mars, if you finish a task, you click on it, it goes away, and then the next task moves in. Um, on Earth, we know what's happening on Mars, but what's crazy is when you're on Earth and you're dealing with these uh, communication delays, you have to live in the present and know that when you make a decision, it's affecting somebody else's uh, past and your future. So you're living in like this crazy paradigm, three different, mm. you know, like mind-bending states. Um, and so what happened in one of our runs and one of our EVA simulations is Mars, the people on Mars got ahead and they were feeling pretty good about themselves. They're like, I got ahead of task. So they clicked their, their task bar early, it shifted over 
And then everything else kind of propagated from there for them, and they started working on the next task. Well, on Earth, we didn't get that, that signal that they were ahead of, of task until, of course, five minutes later, and we were operating under the, under the um, uh, perspective that we were working on time. We hadn't, nobody had gotten ahead or behind anywhere. So by the time we received that, it was actually already too late. We kind of missed the fact that they were on to the next task. This was a pretty big, a wow, aha, like, oh, you know, fill in the four-letter word moment for us <laughs> because we were not expecting to find that. Yeah. And this is a humongous problem that actually nobody really knows what to, de what to do about it. But we're going to have to start thinking about it because what does this mean? That if you're trying to um, take part in an EVA on Mars and, you know, communicate with Earth, do you just say nobody can get ahead? And what if somebody falls behind? How will you know that? And you can't circumvent the delay. So it's a problem that we cannot, um, you know, kind of necessarily bend the rules on. <laughs> yeah, and five, so, five minutes is a lifetime. People literally yeah, live and die in five exactly. minutes. Exactly. Yeah, so that was a pretty recent wow, aha, wow. four-letter word moment. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, um, I, I'm going to take uh, MC's privilege and ask you the final question. It's National Science Week. We're talking science. You are amazing scientists, but scientists are more than their science. Kate, you make clothes. Tell us about it. Well, well, I make clothes. Um, I, and I, I, I'll say two things about that. So I, I feel like a lot of my work is quite esoteric. I'm thinking about things that are happening hundreds of kilometres beneath the Earth's surface. It's a place we can never, we're never going to be able to go. Um, I can never know if I'm right or not. Um, and so I really like coming home at the end of the day and doing something that's very practical. And I know if I've sown the seam the wrong way around, then I know that I've done it wrong and I know what I have to do next time to fix it. Um, and another thing I would say is that uh, it's been a, an extremely useful skill uh, in my work as well. So um, if you recall the time lapses that I showed, most of the people, most of our team working out on the ice sheet, everyone was wearing these kind of black, black big onesie suits. We call them scooter suits. Uh, it's really cold, so maybe it's minus 20 degrees outside, and then especially when you're driving on a snow scooter, and maybe you're driving at 50 kilometres an hour, that's a 50 kilometre an hour wind that you're producing, and you're sitting there maybe for three hours, and it's really, really cold. So you need an extremely warm insulating onesie suit uh, to keep you warm. Now, those suits, in, in all the work I've done previously, um, maybe there's a pool of clothing that everybody gets their clothing from. They're all men's medium suits at smallest. There is nothing wrong with men's medium. <laughs> Unless you're a five Not foot a tall men's woman. Medium. Um, yes. And so I've done so much work wearing these suits, they, they, they probably yeah. each weigh close to 10 kilos. Um, and they're huge, um, and it's really, really hard to do the work. Um, mm -hmm. So for this year, if you notice, there was one person in those time lapses wearing a much more stylish blue and orange suit. <laughs> and that's because I was like, I was, I'd been frustrated all of these years doing this work in clothes that didn't work for me. And I'm like, hang on, I have the skills. <laughs> I can solve this problem. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's really useful um, to then to have these different life skills that then can feed into the science as well and, and help solve those problems. Yeah. So, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Diane, what's your superhero non-science power? Um, superhero non-science power? Um, God, my ability to spend hours peering at nature. Oh, she's also a News Breakfast fan. I will notice that she did not choose to go with that. Tell me about staring at nature. I can, I can, I, my favourite occupation is just watching nature um, and growing things. Um, you garden? Uh, I have a property down in South Gippsland, the place where it rains more than any other place in Australia. Um, it's going to be incredibly wet there this weekend and I yes, just, it um, it's my biggest joy is watching the animals. We've got koalas and wallabies and 
50 species of birds that I'm aware of. I'm not a birder, but I'm becoming one. And just insects and plants, and I just love watching that cycle of life and the um, interactions of different plants um, and the birds, that, the little wrens that pop along the window and pool over the window that are singing at us right now because springs, you know, the breeding season's coming and these little superb wrens are... Mm. Uh, that's my superpower is to spend hours just watching animal behaviour. Nice. I'll give you a bit of an insight to this morning. I met Darlene after she was interviewed by Michael and Virginia on the couch and she said, oh, that was a really good interview. I said, yeah, with a smart breakfast show. <laughs> and, and she's like, oh, you're the weather presenter. I said, yes. She said, can I have a forecast? I said, yes, Darlene, you can along with everyone else, but I want to give you a personal one. And uh, I, I promised you an update tonight. There is another burst on the way through, coming through South Australia as we speak, but the kids are going to be fine on their flight. Now, that done, what's your guilty non-science pleasure? Guilty not, oh my or not even guilty. You mean like chocolate? <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you do when you're not sciencing? I'm a mom and yeah. a wife, and I try to be a good daughter. Um, I have a family and I work and uh, it's juggle. And so, um, you know, it's, I'm in awe of everybody that can do it. It's, it takes a lot of effort to try and make sure that you're present for everything that you do. Um, there's a lot of nights where I don't spend a lot of time sleeping because I'm trying to pick up from the day in either circumstance. And I think any working parent um, has probably been there at some point in time. So um, that's what I do with my, my other time. And, uh, and when I can, I go for a nice run, as I did when I came to Melbourne. It was delightful. The weather was perfect, beautiful. Went up into the botanical gardens. I love to run. And um, it's not a superhero power. It's like, like you know, a slug power run. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I'm <laughs> right next to you on that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so cathartic, you know, yeah. as it is to be present. So, so that's what I do in, in my other time. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we've taken up more than enough of your time and uh, I know Darlene needs to sleep for sure because she's been up since stupid o'clock this morning. But please uh, make them very welcome and, and, and show your thanks for Darlene, Diane and Kate.